Fellow auto detailers, welcome to the show that features interviews with today's most successful auto detailers. This is the Auto Detailing Podcast. Here's your host, Jimbo Balaam. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Auto Detailing Podcast. I'm super excited today on the show. Whew. A guest I've been trying to get on for a really long time. And that guest is Chip Foose. It's amazing. I can't wait for you guys to hear the episode. Um, Chip was uh, gracious enough to let me come and um, hang out with him at his shop, local to me, right in Huntington Beach, California, where he does shop tours from 12 to 1 every day. So that's super cool. Um, so if you ever wanted to meet him potentially, you could go down to his shop. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Chip Foos. Um, but I have one other pretty exciting announcement. Um, and that is I've developed, oh man, I take, I've taken, um, it's been about a year in the works, a year in the work, year in the works. Um, but I've redeveloped this crazy, insane course uh, for you guys. So it's all about how to start and grow a profitable detailing business. So who is this course for? I just want to give you guys a quick rundown because basically what I've done is developed is taken all the questions that you guys have asked me um, over the past three years that I've been doing this um, and then taking uh, my nine years of experience and then taking all my guest experience that I've had on the show and I've wrapped it up into this 14 module course. It's hours and hours of content um, and it's so valuable, it's insane. So what I've done is given you guys multiple options if you're interested in how to start and grow a profitable, keyword being profitable detailing business. So I've given you guys the options, the option to purchase the entire course. Okay. That's one option and you'll get all 14 modules, downloadable video modules, or you can thumb through and buy each individual course separately. Now it's going to be more expensive if you buy each individual course separately, but what that enables you to do is pick and choose which course you want. So let me run through the the each lesson first. And if you go to this the website that I'm about to give you, you can see more details. So lesson number 1 is going to be starting a detailing business. Lesson number 2 is going to be visualizing what type of detailing business you want. Number 3 is laying out your vision. Number 4 Uh, setting up your business for success. Lesson number five, fixed location or mobile, which is better, why? Uh, What equipment do you need? Um, Should you get training or should you fake it till you make it? What packages should you offer in your detailing business? What are additional revenue streams that you can incorporate into your business? How do you use the internet for your financial gain? Talk about SEO hacks, stuff like that. Traditional marketing, so marketing like it's 1990, what it's going to be like your first year in business, uh, how do you hire employees, what to do with them, how to offer employee perks, and all this. Uh, So you can buy each one of those uh, individually for really inexpensive, or you can buy the whole package course and get all of those plus an additional module for free. Um, And what I'm going to do, the first 10 people that want to take action on this, I did this with the Google AdWords course, and it was super successful. So the, the first 10 people that hear my voice, hear this promo for these new courses that I'm going to start promoting pretty heavily, the first 10 people, you're going to get half off. That's right. 50% off of the entire course. I can't do that for the individual courses, but what I'm going to do is give you half off if you want to buy all 14 modules. It's going to be half off. So what you're going to do is if you want half off the 14 module course, again, the best course I've ever developed, um, and I've spent literally a year thinking, planning, strategizing, and about six months developing um, go to autodetailingpodcast.com slash start. That's autodetailingpodcast.com slash start. And then the coupon code that you're going to use is half off. That's all together. 
half off. So go to autodetailingpodcast.com slash start and then use coupon code half off if you want to get half off my brand new course. This is only for the first 10 people. The first 10 people get half off the whole 14 module course at autodetailingpodcast.com slash start. I hope you'll take advantage of that. And if you do, great. If you only want to buy an individual lesson, that's great too. Each one of those lessons runs 20 to 30 minutes. So it's value-packed content, well worth it. I'll see you on the inside over there, and I hope you enjoyed this episode with Chip Foos. Chip Foos is my guest today. So, Chip? Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jimbo. Thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. We're sitting in your gorgeous showroom. Oh, thank you. Um, where you do tours, right? Well, maybe not you, but you have yeah, tours. Yeah, we actually have tours uh, Monday through Friday from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. So cool. while the guys are at lunch, nice. then we can allow people to come Perfect in and time. see the projects. But, and that's uh, totally free for yeah. the public to do? Yeah. Cool. So you're based in Huntington Beach or your shop is? And yep. So if, if you listening want to do that, 12 to 1, Monday through Friday. <laughs> um, we'll be here. Yeah. And my uh, this is kind of cool for me, too, because my my first memory of hearing your name was back in um, 2000, I want to say four, and my friend was getting a pair of rims for his F-150. Bought a brand new F-150. He went down to a tire shop in Signal Hill. And he settled on a pair of 22-inch Foose Spanx. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> so that's my first memory. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I remember, um, I'm a detailer, but that was long before mm-hmm. I got into detailing cars and stuff like that. But I, I always remember those rims, and those things were pretty freaking popular. I, I remember they seeing were. them you know, on a lot of different cars. Yeah. So that's my earliest memory of hearing your name. <laughs> but this show is not about me. I, I want to hear um, kind of your journey and your... Um, you know, how you got to this. Wow, my journey. Mm. So we don't have to go how, too detailed. How far but, do you want me to go back? Well, let's, <laughs> let's go back to, uh, why don't we go back to, give me a little bit of background on like your parents. All right. And, well, and then maybe your childhood and then what that led into, you know, that. Well, it's interesting because a lot of people say, when do you remember being introduced to cars? And I don't ever remember being introduced to cars. I was born into this. Mm. My father did the same thing. He actually lived on his own by the age of 14. Wow. And he started a hot rod shop. And uh, he lived in his girlfriend's mom's garage. She gave him that because his parents wanted to move from Santa Barbara back to Long Beach. Okay. And my dad didn't want to go because all of his friends were up there. So he stayed. And it's a great town. <laughs> and so he started a, a little shop. And, uh, you know, by the time I was born, he was running, uh, well, actually, he was running a body shop in Santa Barbara, but he, he had met Gene Winfield. Mm-hmm. And Gene asked him to come and run his shop. Mm. And we ended up in Arizona. Uh, Gene had AMT at the time. And my father was running AMT where they were building... A lot of the, uh, you know, cars for television and, and show cars and whatnot. And AMT is also the plastic model kit company. So the cars they were building were being turned into plastic models as well as Hot Wheels. So as a oh, kid, wow. uh, oh, oh. the cars that I was going to the shop on the weekend with my dad, the cars right. that he was building, right. and I was watching him build, I could then build at home in a plastic model kit. And I was also carrying him around as Hot Wheels right. in my pocket. So oh, it was like, cool wow, is this that? is what my dad does. Right. And to this day, I feel that my career is an extension of my father's mm-hmm. because when I ended up going to work with Boyd, mm-hmm. you know, the first thing I said to Boyd is, I want to get the cars that we're building to be built into plastic model kits and try and get them <laughs> built as Hot Wheels, right. which we ended up doing there. And wow. I'm doing it here as well. And That's like incredible. I said, it's, is that just surreal for you to be like an extension of your childhood or something that was so not fundamental, but so like valuable to you as a kid to be able to be like, that's my dad building that. And in and, and the same way you're building it yourself and caring, like, is that cool to be able to relive that as an adult? And I'm redo still a that? kid. I, well, <laughs> <laughs> me too. That's, that's the fun part about, I think you the know, car I, culture in general, you know, I just feel blessed and lucky to be able to do what I do for a living. Mm-hmm. And I mean, let's face it, I, I make a living doing something 100% unnecessary. Wow. You know, the world doesn't right. need another hot rod. Right. But the greatest thing about this whole industry is it's 100% passion driven. It, it, and that's across the board, no matter where, what little niche inside the car space you find yourself. It, it, 
passion is flowing unbelievably. Yeah. I'd do this for free if, if I had to. What but. were some, did you know that you wanted to take it from like the level that your dad had it and beyond? Did you have that aspiration to do it or did that kind of just develop as your skills got shown to the world? I always thought that I would end up working for a car company. You okay. know, I, I left Santa Barbara, I went to uh, Art Center College of Design, I had gone halfway through couldn't afford to stay. I went back to Santa Barbara. I opened my own little design firm. Mm. Uh, I was also working with my father. And then I met uh, Alain Clenet and Mark Sternberger. They had a design group called Sternberger Clenet. And I had designed a project. Alain saw it. He offered me a job. Mm. So I went to work with them and ended up bringing my entire studio into their oh, wow. uh, facility. That's and, in Santa Barbara? Yes. Okay. And so I was working for them. You know, nine to five, mm -hmm. and then working late nights doing design work. And I had been dating my wife for about a year and a half. And the subject of marriage came up one night, and she says, Well, you know, she had graduated from UCSB, okay. University of California, Santa Barbara. Yep. And my sister went there. Yeah. <laughs> so she says, Well, I have a college degree, and I want my spouse to have a college degree. So, like I said, I left Art Center halfway through. Now right. I knew I needed to get back. Okay. Were you school? Were, like when you were in high school, did you? Were you into school? Were you not into school? Was I wasn't a great student. Okay. I basically mostly A's and B's. Okay. Uh, Compared without, to me, I'd call that a great student. <laughs> without any studying at all. Okay. Wow. You know, okay. Basically, just you know, wing it. Okay. And I ended up, like I said, I went halfway through mm -hmm. Art Center. Knew I needed to go back. Now, one right. one of our clients at Sternberg Clinet. Mm -hmm was a group out of uh, Michigan, and they had offered me a job. They were trying to steal me. Okay. And I called them up. They made me an offer, and I thought, okay, with this offer, I can save enough money if I go there for three years okay. to go back and graduate. So uh, I told my boss I was leaving. He asked me why. I told him the whole story. He says, I'll send you to school now. You give me three years after you graduate. So a month later, I was back at school. Oh, wow. Finishing up at school, my senior project was a Chrysler-sponsored project mm -hmm. where they wanted us to design a niche market vehicle. Okay. The example they gave us was a guy that likes to work out on, a, on an exercise bike. Maybe that exercise bike charges a battery that you can put in a car and get to and from work. And I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, that's something I'm probably never going to do in my lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> but I took a second approach. Okay. I went ahead and did the type of designs that they wanted. Right. But I took a second approach, which was really taboo at Art Center. Mm -hmm. You know, at Art Center, if you were messing around with hot rods or custom cars and and uh, muscle cars, right? They usually frowned upon it and said, "You need to just concentrate on the future of hot, of car design." Okay. You know, this for is for the general public, right? Got it. That's what they wanted you to study okay. and, and work on. But I did a whole second presentation, and it was for Tom Gale, who at the time was the president of Chrysler. That's who we did our presentation to. Mm. So he came in and I had two separate presentations. And he says, okay, I know what you're doing here, but what are you doing here? Right. And I said, well, you asked us to create a niche market vehicle. And in my mind, if you're trying to create a niche market vehicle, then you're also trying to create a customer. Right. What I'm doing uh, over here is I'm catering to a customer that already exists. Right. Which would be the standard way of doing stuff. The way the art center wanted you to right. do it. Got it. So my second presentation, yep. which was all muscle cars and hot rods, oh, just wow. modernized. Right. I said, this is catering to a customer that already exists. There are thousands of people out there that mm -hmm. are taking their old muscle car bodies and trying to put modern technology into them so they can drive them daily and just enjoy it. What year is this around? This is in 1990. Okay. So I went ahead and, and Tom Gale fell in love with one of my mm. proposals where I took the side view of 70 Cuda mm -hmm. and the plan view of a 30s Plymouth. Mm. and morphed them together wow. and designed a car that I call the Hemisphere, which became the Plymouth Prowler. That was the inspiration for that car. Got it. Wow. Well, I did that presentation. He fell in love with that car. I built that model. Mm -hmm. Boyd Coddington had seen that model at the SEMA show, and he asked me to start doing some design work for him. And so I worked for Boyd as I was talking about passion. Yep. I ended up working with Boyd for... Two and a half, almost a full three years after I graduated, right. where I was back up in Santa Barbara. Yep. And I was working for him for 30 to 50 hours a week. And doing the side thing and at night. 
No, right? no, no. Like, I was working. I was. I had my full time job, but I was oh, doing. Oh, okay. Got I was it. doing thirty to fifty hours a week for Boyd alone. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. And it was just my hobby. Right. You know, I never gave Boyd a bill for two and a half years. Right. It was, if I was building a car and I needed a set of wheels, Boyd gave them to me overnight. But wow. I just felt lucky that I was involved right. with what Boyd was doing. Right. And my boss came to me one day. He says, "Hey, when you're finished with this project, I don't have another project for you." He said, do you think we can bring Boyd's work in and you can bill him for what you're doing until we get this job? There was a job coming in from China that was about six months out. Mm. And I said, well, the problem is I don't bill Boyd, so I don't see how I can do that. Right. <laughs> he said, well, is there anything else that you might be able to do? So I called a friend of mine, Andy Jacobson, who was the head of the Ford Truck Studio. I had met mm. him. I had also done some work with them in the past. Notice he pulled up in a Ford truck today, right? Yes, I did. <laughs> and uh, Andy made me an offer to come and work on one of the new truck design projects. So, okay. So I was looking at going to Ford for only six months. Got it. And then I got a call from Jay Mays, who worked for Volkswagen, and he says, Hey, he says, I hear you're going to Ford. I said, Well, it's only for six months. So I'm going to do this project and then come back to uh, Sternberg, Cluny. And uh, he says, Well, I've got a project I'd love to put you on. He <laughs> says, We're going to do a new Beetle. Oh, wow. So now I was deciding, well, do I go to Volkswagen or do I go to Ford? Right. And I called Boyd and let him know that I was possibly going to be going to either one of them and that the projects that I had designed with him, maybe we should find somebody to help us with it. Mm. And he asked me to come down to see him. So I drove down from Santa Barbara to Stanton, California, okay. yep. and visited him that night. And he made me a better offer than both of them. Wow. I thought, wow, this is my dream job. <laughs> right. So I accepted it. Wow. Right on the spot, or oh, wow! And I told my boss that everything worked out. He says, "Okay, get with Human Resources and you know, figure out what's going on exactly." Mm -hmm. So I went down to Human Resources, and I had only put in two and a half years. I hadn't right. filled the complete three years. So they said, "Well, you got to pay us for what you still owe us on your schooling uh. before you go." I'm like, "I'm doing this to help you," <laughs> but they said I had uh. to pay. I said, "Okay." Now I had seven weeks of back vacation pay that they hadn't paid me for because right. I had never taken a vacation. Right. <laughs> so it worked out. They owed me more money than I owed them. Oh, wow. So you just and cashed in your vacation. I just said, just call it a wash. Right, right. And I said, but I don't have to come back. I'll right. come back if I want to, but if I fall in love with this job, I'm not coming back. Right. And that's exactly what happened. I ended up being at Boyd's for another five years mm -hmm. before they unfortunately went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And I remember the last day uh, my wife and I had planned to go visit some friends, so she was going to come up and pick me up. And now I hadn't been paid for seven weeks of work at Boyd's because everything had gone bankrupt. Right. I was staying to try and keep everything going. Right. I was down to seven hundred dollars in the bank. I had a house payment due in two weeks of sixteen hundred. Didn't know how I was going to pay it. <laughs> and had just spent that day loading everybody's toolboxes up in their trucks and they were all going away and that was it this was the final day that mm -hmm. boyd's hot rod shop was open she comes to pick me up i get in the car and before i start the car she hands me a brown paper bag she says i want you to open this first so i open the bag and i pull out this tiny little t-shirt that says i love daddy oh <clears throat> so now i knew i didn't have a job had 700 dollars in the bank couldn't make a house and payment pregnant. and my wife was pregnant <laughs> And that's when we started Foos Design. That was in uh, that's incredible. May of 1998. That's incredible. And that's a great story to talk about <laughs> now in a horrible situation to be in. Not, <coughs> not being pregnant, but just the whole, you know, 700 bucks house payment. So how did that, what did you do in those two weeks to get the house payment? Well, uh, one of the guys that worked at Boyd's had left and gone to work for uh, PPI, which okay. was Precision yep. Power Inc., mm -hmm. uh, car stereo company. Mm -hmm. He called me up. And he says, hey, would you be willing to design our entire 99 line of product? I said, I'll do it on a royalty basis. He says, well, how do you want that to work? I said, I'll do an advance on royalties of $10,000. Okay. I'll do the design work. Mm -hmm. When you start to sell them, yep. you keep a, a 3 to 5% royalty on everything that sells until you pay right. off the 10000 and then I start to collect. He says, all right, let me go talk to my bosses. He called me back. He says, done. I said, all right, send me a check for ten grand, and I'll start designing. <laughs> so, so did that not only pay your house payment but also help fund Foos that's, Designs? That's what got us started. Got it. And yeah. did you start, obviously not in no, this but building? No, I just but had my uh, back bedroom in the house okay. and the garage. And you were only just straight 
designing at that point. Yes, and okay. I kept one project from Boyd's, brought okay. that to the house, and I was working on that in the garage. Got it. And then I hear that, and I don't want to jump around too much because that was an incredible story, but, and I want to hear kind of the, the growth of Foose Designs and obviously how that developed into the TV show and all that. But where did, um, were you always painting? Because I, I hear you're an incredible wet sander as well. <laughs> So that's actually what Jason Rose told me, that you're an incredible wet sander. Um, that's funny. But uh, were, were you always painting as well, like painting the cars yeah, that, actually, well, and building the cars that you were also designing? Or well, My dad came back to Santa Barbara in 1969. He started a shop called Project Design. Okay. And I went to work with him at the age of seven. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to say I was helping him, but I think I destroyed <laughs> yeah. a lot more than I helped. Well, you have kids. You know how that goes now. <laughs> <laughs> But I ended up being a painter for 15 years with my dad. Okay. So, yeah, I learned a lot working with my father. Do you think uh, being a painter helped uh, the, you as a designer or vice versa? Do you oh, think yes. they played in? Okay. Yeah, because when you're a painter and you're doing surfacing work, mm. you're learning transitions from one form into another. Got it. Okay. And that's what designing is, right. taking shapes and putting them together. Yeah. So and knowing you, how to surface things mm-hmm. is a huge benefit as a designer. Got it. Yeah, and you could actually, you can, if you know that now and then you look at your designs, you could really see how that, they complement each other and, and you've well, really taken you. that knowledge. So, um, so you start Foose Designs after Boyd's, you're in a garage or a back bedroom in a garage, mm-hmm. whatever, um, and it sounds like your skill set and you were just good at what you did, great at what you well, did, you. which is evident. Obviously, it's evident, but sometimes uh, you know you're great or people are telling you you're great before the whole world knows. And so that takes time for word of mouth to spread around for you to kind of get air under you and get lifted, right? So what was – did that happen pretty quickly because you were already on the radar of like the guy at Chrysler and some of these other Um, people? Well, I had a couple projects that I was doing, you know, once Boyd's collapsed. Right. I had taken – Everybody that was at Boyd's Hot Rod Shop, when we shut the doors down, I gave everybody a piece of paper, and it was a number to a hot rod shop and the owner, and they had a job. Uh, The car that they were working on was going to that shop. So I placed uh, all these cars in different hot rod shops and sent the person that was working on that car to work for that shop as well. hmm. So I was the only one that didn't have a job. So I started working out of of the house. Got it. any questions on those vehicles, I was going to those shops and answering those questions and, and started working okay. that way. <clears throat> I quickly ended up renting a small shop in Orange. Mm-hmm. It was only 900 square feet. Mm-hmm. But I brought one of the guys that I worked with at Boyd, Steve Graninger, who he and I just worked great together. Mm-hmm. Brought him in. We were out there for about a year before I rented the first bay of, of the four bays that we own now. What year is this? 1999. Okay. So we left in 99, and I, and I moved into the little shop oh, wow. on the end here. Yep. And we've just grown ever since The one then. they're working in the Mustang? The yes. 71 Mustang? Yep. Okay, cool. Wow. And then you've... Because there's actually four addresses here. There's four 2,500-square-foot oh, wow. shops. Wow. Okay. So there's two buildings, two addresses in each building, but I bought both buildings, and now I have all four. So do you still have four different? Are they still? There's have four actually di- four different four. addresses, <laughs> and we just we just use the first one. Okay, that's funny. <laughs> I could see the mail person being like, "What the heck is like a new mail guy?" Yeah, coming? it's kind of strange. Like, but if I ever heck? need to downsize, I can just rent. Yeah. each shop. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't think you're going to need to do that anytime soon. But um, <laughs> so where did uh, so you move into that first shop, and does, do things just start getting exponentially busier? Well, no, not really. It. Um, you know, we, we, we were just working on a couple cars. Okay. And then uh, it was interesting. I got a call from Jesse James, who we had worked together at Boyd's. Another local boy. Well, yeah. was local. Yep. <laughs> and uh, he told me about this television show that he was going to do called Monster Garage. Mm-hmm. He wanted me to be his co-host. And help How him. did you guys know? How did you guys... You just knew of each other because... We both worked at Boyd's together. Oh, got it. Yeah. Okay. So... I went up and, and met with him, and he told me about the first two projects. One was going to be a Mustang turned into a lawnmower. The other one's going to be a Ford Explorer turned into a trash truck. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm here trying to build the most beautiful pieces right. of rolling art that I can build. Yep. And you want to put me on television <laughs> to build building these monsters that 
I saw no value to the cars at the mm-hmm. end of the show. Right. Okay. You know, they're just being built to perform a task. Right. And I wasn't interested in being known for doing that. So I mm-hmm. said no. And that was the greatest no in business I've ever given. Mm-hmm. Because the executives from Discovery sent another producer, Bud Bretzman, to my shop and said, all right, what do you want to do? And Wow. So Bud comes in and tells me he's going to do a reality show based on my life and just follow me 24-7. I said, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> I, I didn't think of that as, you know, I'm not that interested. Right, right, right. So I said, let me call what, Jay Mays. What year is this? This is in 2002. Okay. I said, uh, actually it was 2001. I said, let me call Jay Mays and see if he's got something that he wants to send us. Because Jay now had left Volkswagen, was the head of Ford's design studio. Okay. So they were just about to release the Thunderbird. Yep. And I told them I wanted to, if, if they had a car that they wanted me to build, I would build it on a one-hour television show and take it to the SEMA show. And I remember Bud Brutzman, the producer, he says, well, what's the SEMA show? I said, trust me. <laughs> if you're a car enthusiast, that's the show you want to go to because mm-hmm. everything is there. And are you as well known, uh, obviously not as well known as you are now, but were you starting to already develop a name for yourself? Or? In the hot rod world, I was well okay. known. Okay. Because we had built so many cars that had won so many awards. And, okay. And yeah, they're... Because they're, I'm just wondering, <clears throat> here, here's what I was thinking. If, so Discovery has Jesse James, and maybe he's built up his following at that time, obviously not to what it is now. And then is he the one sharing your name with a different producer at Discovery? And, I really don't know what went okay. down after that meeting, but okay. I know that some of the producers... I'm just trying to wonder there. what the draw... Um, what the obviously they were looking for shows. Reality TV was becoming popular mm-hmm. at that time. But well, I, Bud told me that he was talking to everybody in the industry, okay. and that everybody said, "Talk to Chip." Talk to Chip. Chip. Okay, cool. So he came in, and uh, you know, first he just wanted to follow our next build to the next show. But yep. It was eleven months out to go to compete for the Riddler. Okay. So I said, "Let's just get something that we can film quickly." Right. So I called Jay Mays. He says, "I'll send you a Thunderbird." Now, I was supposed to get this Thunderbird in June. I didn't get it until September 12th. For a November, first week of November yes. show. So I started working. Oh, my gosh. So now we had it's less like, than seven weeks to get to the show. So I started working 40 hours straight, and then I'd sleep for eight, and then I'd work for 40 and sleep for eight. I did that for six weeks. Did the last six days with no sleep. I had people helping me, right. but nobody else. I didn't ask anybody else to right. you know, work Do those that. hours right, as well. Right, right, right. But we got the car done. We barely made it to SEMA. Ugh. We were actually awarded Best of Show oh, wow. from Ford Motor Company. And that was... That'd the, be 2001 as well? This, this was, uh, yeah, okay. November of 2001. So that was filming the pilot episode for a show called Rides, if you remember yep. that. Yep, And Discovery loved it. They turned it into a series. Uh, they ended up filming 59 episodes of that. But it was during the filming that I kept saying to Bud, the producer, you know, I want to do a series where we build a car in a week. Hmm. And after Discovery had, had loved the pilot, he came back to me and says, okay, we got our series. What are we building next? I said, no, 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 no. I said, Rides isn't the show that I want to do. Mm-hmm. Rides is a great show because it's documenting real builds. Mm. And I gave him a list of 25 different shops and the owner's names and their phone numbers. I said, call all these guys, <clears throat> see what they're working on, when their next project's starting. Because you can send a film crew up there once a week, or once a month, right. and in ten months you got twenty five episodes. We can't do that here. Right. I didn't realize that I should have owned it. It was my concept. <laughs> right. but I just gave it to Bud. Right. Right. And I told him, I said, I want to take cars from garages and side yards where people don't have the money or the means, mm. and let's just restore their car, or build their dream car, and give it back to them. Where did that idea come from? First of all, of wanting to do it in such a short amount of time, seven days. The quicker you can do it. Uh, the less it costs production-wise. Okay. And also, that's how Monster Garage was working. So okay. I thought, that's the only way we're going to get a series where we can put out a show every you know two weeks or so. Right. Okay. And so Bud had the idea of actually pranking the owner <laughs> right. and having some fun with him, right. which I think was brilliant, and I think that made the show. Mm. And uh, so he pitched the idea to Discovery. They ordered seven episodes right off the bat. Wow. And you know the rest is history. We yeah. just... Had an absolute ball. We've done over 130 episodes. Wow. And, you know, I get asked all the time, what's your favorite episode you ever did on Overhaul? <laughs> and it's never, you know, or what's your favorite car you've done on right. Overhaul? It's never the car. It's the people that we built for. Mm. 
And I remember the one that really meant the most to me was we did a 69 Roadrunner convertible Mm -hmm. for a guy named John. John had bought this car when he was 15 years old. It was his dream car his whole life. He always wanted to put a Hemi in it. It had a 440 in it when he got it. The car was in pieces in the garage. Uh He had two daughters that were in college. So it was a long off dream that, you know, maybe one day he'll build his car. But I read in the submission that he wanted a Hemi and that he wanted a, a manual shift transmission. Mm-hmm. And we went ahead and we called Mopar Performance. They donated a 528 Hemi. Wow. And we put a five-speed <laughs> manual shift transmission in it. And I put a Hemi badge on the side of the car when we did the unveiling. And I remember when he opened his eyes and saw the car for the first time, he had a crack in his voice and he says, does it really have a Hemi in it? <laughs> <laughs> and Bud Bretzman, the producer, <clears throat> normally we would introduce whoever had worked on the motor to come out and open the hood and show right. it to the owner. Bud says, go ahead and open the hood. So John walked over on his own and opened the hood. And when he saw the Hemi in there, he dropped to his knees oh, wow. and started to cry. Now, wow. John was a giant of a man. He was probably six feet, four inches tall, mm-hmm. 260 pounds. Wow. <laughs> and Did the on ground the, shake? <laughs> on the television show... You know, you saw John get emotional for a few seconds and then say thank you to all of us. In reality, he dropped to his knees and started to cry. And it took him about 25 minutes to compose himself enough to be able to thank us. Wow. As he said, we we just turned his lifetime fantasy into a reality. Wow. And that's what overhauling was all about for me. Just those few seconds of somebody, you know, getting that emotional Mm -hmm. makes you feel so good that you could do that for him that you wanted to do it again and again and again. Have you seen them since? Yeah. Did, yeah. So do people that you did their their cars, do they drop by from time to time? Every and, once in a while, yeah, okay. they come by. And it's great to see those cars again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was that like more on a personal front for you to all of a sudden have, obvious, to have cameras everywhere and, and kind of producers and developing a show? Was that ever wearing or, or taxing or, or you know, I just was that an adjustment? It was, it, was, it was an adjustment just because it was a part of the shop. Okay. Now, what they needed to get used to is, you know, they would ask us to do things again. Can you do that again? We didn't get it. And I would just say to them, get it on the next build. Got you know, it. Because we only had eight days to right. build that car. Yeah. So I said, if you missed it, you missed it. Right. I don't have time to recreate all this mm. stuff and do it over and over because we're trying to get the car done. Now, in the beginning... I went the full eight days with zero sleep, not even a nap. So to stop and have to recreate something just so they could get it on camera, right? we did it a few times, sure. but I just told them, look, I'm focused on getting the car done. You yeah. guys focus on getting what you need to mm-hmm. get. And let's just... So the learning through. curve was probably more on their end, trying to I, capture I think so, because they were, they were doing something that had never been done before. Right. And, wow. you know, all through those builds, when we were doing them in eight days... Mm-hmm. You know, that was really taxing. And we filmed for five years. Then we took a five-year hiatus Mm -hmm. and then came back and filmed for another three and a half. Okay. After the hiatus, when they came back and said, we want to do overhauling again, do you want to do it? I said, yeah, I'd love to do it, but not in eight days. You know, I was getting older and I needed to sleep and I knew I couldn't do the eight days again like that. So I said, let's do the cars in three weeks and just get them done. I said, we don't have to do them in the eight days. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, what that did is... uh, took away a lot of the pranks because uh, you couldn't extend it out right three weeks where we could what we could do in the eight days that we right. had before you know everybody assumes it was seven days but it was day one through seven and then d-day was delivery day which right. was actually the eighth day yep so if we started a project on monday we delivered it the monday after mm. and that was a lot of work to do in eight days and a lot of work to keep that person at bay. With John's story, if the car was in pieces in his garage, what was the prank? Did you, how did you um, maneuver that? We had a guy show up at his house with a printed ad with the car for sale. And he says, I'm not selling my car. And Could you imagine his week? So he, he <laughs> ran him out of there. Right. And then we pretended like uh, somebody broke in and stole Oh, uh, okay. So now he had an insurance uh, claim that his car was stolen. So did you guys have to mitigate that? Yeah, so now we had a (laughs) false insurance agent going in and messing with him. I think I remember that because when he said he fell to his knees in tears, I feel like I remember watching that, Mm -hmm. but I feel like that might have happened more than once. So my my mind's a little foggy on that, but what an incredible 
I mean, talk about an emotional roller coaster for you too, of being just completely gassed, worn out. You haven't slept in eight days, and then to have this emotional, this guy be so emotional, and you've you know turned his life completely around. I remember the the first build. Uh, We got the car done, and then we're getting ready to do the reveal. And Bud tells me to go in this back room, and there's no windows in the room or anything else. I go, wait a minute, we just built the car, and you're going to tell me to go into the room when the owner comes out to see the car? (laughs) I said, that's not happening. Yeah. I said, I did all this work <laughs> right. to see the expression on the owner's face. Yeah, I want to be front and center. So I stood behind the cameras all the time and, and watched what happened because that's, that's, incredible. that's the most precious moment for me is seeing the reaction of the owner. Mm-hmm. So um, I was going to ask the question how the TV show helped Foose designs grow, but obviously I think that's obvious. Um, or maybe well, not. It's but, interesting. I mean, there was really no money in it at first. Mm. It was it was more like okay, yeah, let's just have some fun. But I knew that if I did it right, mm-hmm. that it would open up the doors to be a spokesperson for companies. So when you say do it right, what do you mean by that? By um, keeping true to what your vision of I what wanted you a wholesome show. I okay. didn't want cussing and screaming, Got and it. fighting, or yep. anything like that. Mm-hmm. I wanted it to be a feel good show. Mm-hmm. If we were doing good design which would make the show timeless, right. then reruns would, would keep running. Uh, so I knew if I did something really trendy, right. you know, that's today, right. then three years from now, It'd nobody's going to want to see it. Got it. But if you do classic cars mm-hmm. and you do good design work, it's timeless. And then, so your plan was that that would not lead into uh, royalties on reruns, but... Right, because there's none. Okay, yeah. but, it, but it would lead... It would, open up the doors for you to connect with companies to become spokes right. people for them. Use their products on the cars that we're building. And, Got it. And so at least you're not, not being paid from the show and having to pay for right. the parts that you can mm-hmm. <laughs> So it's instead of being a loss leader. Got it. Yep. So where is Foos Designs today? Or where is... We're, we're I, I wanted to Beach. say Fo- <laughs> I, I want to say Foos, but it, I know it's <laughs> Foos Designs, but it, it seems like you have a lot more going on than just designs. So what is, well, what is Foos today? What is Foos today? Um, when I think of the name Foos, uh, of course, it's my father's and my last name. Mm. But I think who designed it, the who designed the Foos? I did the logo okay. in 1984 okay. as a project at Art Center. Oh wow! Incredible, so, cool. When, Sorry when to I, interrupt. When I went I just... to Art Center. That was, or actually, I think it was '86. Okay. Was when I did the logo. Wow. But uh, talk about timeless, right? Yeah. It, it is a timeless. Thank you. Thank you. Simple, clean, yeah. elegant. Love it. And it was inspired by a friend of mine who had done his name. Okay. And it was, I noticed that each letter uh-huh. was forming half of the other letter. And that's all I did. Oh, uh, so yeah. I thought, oh, that's really cool. Incredible. And I wanted to look almost like a neon sign. Yep, yep. So, yeah, he, um, he inspired me on that. His was quite different, but just the fact that the letters were forming other letters yep. were wow. pretty, was, I thought was pretty cool. That's cool. But, um, yeah, I mean, Foos Design, what, when I think of that name, what I think about is how it represents a group of guys that are coming together mm. trying to do their absolute best to build rolling art. Wow. So I think of Foos as this group of guys here at the shop. Wow. And like I say, And we, you being one of those guys, right? Because yes. as I walked, I forget his name who showed me around no. when I was kind of just moseying around. But, you know, he's, I, I said, you know, is, is Chip really in here? You know, not getting his hands dirty, but really, because I saw you inspecting the Ford in the mm-hmm. spray booth. And he's like, are you kidding me? He's <laughs> like, he is, he's probably worked on the majority of this car. He is like in here grinding it out too. So well, you're not just I was here in till office. I was here till nine thirty last night, but I was here until five thirty the morning before. I went home and showered and cleaned up and came back, so I hadn't slept. So when I slept last night, you don't I have a shower or cot here, Paul? No, I don't. <laughs> but sometimes I'll sleep on the couch in the office. Oh my gosh! And I almost did that, but I thought, no, nah, I want to go home and shower and clean up. And well, that's if that doesn't scream passion, I don't know what does. How many How many kids do you have? Two kids. Okay. I've got a seventeen year old son, Brock. Okay. And a 12-year-old daughter, Katie. Oh, cool. And is, is Brock or Katie, have they, uh, do they work here? Do they do what you did um, with your dad almost? They'll or? come in and they'll, they'll help wherever we need some help mm-hmm. sometimes. Uh, I don't know if they'll end up, either one of them end up being here full-time mm-hmm. someday. But, uh, you know, it'd be fun if they did, yeah. either one of them or both of them. But no pressure, right? No, no pressure. <laughs> it's whatever they want to do. Yeah. My son is really into movies. Oh, cool. Okay. So I don't know yeah. if he'll get into the film industry or... 
Yeah, Maybe he's... film design, right? Yeah, who knows? That'd be cool. Maybe it'll be a whole separate arm of <laughs> Foose Designs. And it'll be, who knows? Mm-hmm. So where do you see, um, where do you want to take this company now? To the Classic Car Show in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's right. We haven't <laughs> talked about it yet. The Classic Car Show. That's right. Coming up. Well, by the time this goes live, it'll be, this go, is going to go live on Monday. So it'll probably, what is the date? 17. I think it'll be the following week. Yeah. If not, so. Yeah, it's coming uh, up. We're going to take two cars there. I'm going to take cool. the Black 56 pickup yep. here and also the 39 Cadillac that we yep. just built for West Rydell, which started life as a four-door sedan. Mm-hmm. And it oh, is wow. now a two-door liftoff hardtop. I'm glad you're better at this than I am. That was a great segue <laughs> to the classic auto <laughs> um, You would think after 260 episodes, I'd be a little bit more polished. Um, so what are, what are you going to – that's a great idea. So what are you going to be doing at the Classic Auto Show? Well, you know, they called me up and let me know that they were doing this show. And uh, there's a lot of exciting people that are going to be there. Mm-hmm. A lot of the talent from the Velocity yeah. Channel. Yep. Uh, we got Bruce Meyer, who is yep. a – an incredible man, and he's got an incredible collection of cars. Mm-hmm. A lot of his cars are going to be at the show. He's also the Grand Marshal there. Awesome. Uh, but uh, we've got several of the, as I talked about, several of the talent. Uh, we got Dave Kindig, we got Mike Brewer, we mm-hmm. got Wayne Carini, mm-hmm. uh, myself, uh, and I know there's some other guys, and I apologize if I. Mike if, Phillips, Mike there's Phillips, uh, yeah. Chris Jacobs. Yes, Chris Jacobs. Um, of course. Who I think I know who he is. <laughs> yeah, I was I was waiting for you to mention his name, and I'm like, <laughs> well, that's that's like mentioning your wife. You, know, yeah. you, you, you think I'm going to be there? Well, Chris will be there of too. Of course, <laughs> yeah. It's so obvious that it's. But uh, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to spending the weekend with those guys yeah. and uh, visiting and and meeting all the people who have great. You know, that's that's the greatest thing yeah. about this whole industry is you meet people with the same passion that you have. Isn't it incredible? And we just have a great weekend, and there's going to be lots of uh, different vendors there you know, with all their different products. Mm-hmm. And there's, I think, I'm trying to remember, Avenue of... They're, they're calling something that's a strip of different cars. I'm not sure. They told me, and I yeah, can't I, remember. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember the name, but there's an avenue of all these really cool cars, mm. and two of mine are going to be on that avenue. So <laughs> can't wait to see the rest of the avenue. Yeah, and are you going to be doing a signing there or anything like that? I don't that? know exactly what okay. I'm doing, but yeah, I'll be signing, and I think sure. we're going to be answering questions. Oh, cool. Yeah, I think so. there's going to be some, I don't know if they call them breakout sessions or, or I forget what they call them too, but there's going to be some interaction with the customer yeah. or not the customers the fans um but you know it's funny you, you reminded me of uh when i sat down with barry mcguire i said man you guys do so many car shows you know isn't that just tiring and he goes tiring isn't it great mm-hmm. he goes the same thing you said it's so awesome to connect with other people that have the same passion as you he goes mm-hmm. and i've been all over the world and it's all the same around cars yeah, it's, it's interesting i've worked with people in the past that you know, if there's somebody else that's building cars, that's their competition, and, and they really yeah. were aggressive about right. it. I view all other builders as potential best friends because they have the same passion I do. Right. So I, I, I just look at them differently, and, right. and that's the way I want them to look at me because if they have a question for me, I'm going to answer it 100% or go to their shop and help them right. if I can. That's you know, incredible. It's, that's what it is, is. We're all here trying to do the <clears> same thing, and there's enough work out there for all of us. You know, and that to since this is the auto detailing podcast, that translates into the detailing space as well because especially where we are here in Southern California, there's so much competition, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. I guess they can't see my air quotes. Um, but I try to have the same mindset of like, look how many – if we just look out here, out your front windows at how many cars there are, I couldn't do all these cars no. by myself. And neither could all of the detailers – in all of Orange County, do all of the cars in all of Orange right. County. So why are we fighting each other? We should be lifting the industry up together. And that exactly. sounds like what you're you saying, know, that's too. That's what I wanted Overholland to do, mm. was lift the industry and show this professionals yeah. coming together, having a great time, yep. doing something cool for somebody. And, and the industry has to be grateful to you for doing that. Instead of being some arrogant jerk that's trying to bag on other shops, they have this figure that's actually lifting the other other guys up that's an, that's good well, on you for that you know i just you know it's interesting to me i see a lot of these other shows that are really not doing justice for the industry mm. and then you see a cooking show come on and it just looks so professional whatever mm. it is a cooking show always looks professional mm. and i think that's what our industry should be doing with anybody that's in the automotive yeah. industry on television mm. 
So if there's, and this will be my last question, if if there's someone listening that has this affinity for cars and maybe even car design, what would be your advice to them? Say they're, they're maybe in high school, college, maybe they're 40, 50 years old and sick and tired of their career. Maybe they're retiring. You're, you're the one that said it. Your first notice of Foose Design was a set of wheels. So before I started my shop, mm-hmm. I started the wheel company. It's a licensing deal with MHT. Mm-hmm. They manufacture and retail the wheels. I design them. But that gives me a royalty. Every month there's a check in the mailbox. That covers all the bills. Yep. I can honestly say and, and uh, you know, I'm proud of the fact that I have never been a day late with a, an mm. employee's paycheck. Mm. You know, they've been Huge. paid every month. Yep. I don't rely on the customer paying for the car that's being built on their money to make sure that they're right. paid. I have other sources of income that yep. are covering all the bills. Mm-hmm. This is just my passion <clears throat> to be able to build these cars. This is where I get to come and, and hang and out, enjoy the day, yep. and get to build these incredible cars. But this is the marketing tool mm-hmm. for all of Foos Design to market Got those it. wheels so that hopefully they'll sell and all the other products that we have. But uh, yeah, if you can get something started that's going to be a monetary source mm-hmm. so that you're not relying on building a car to make your income got it you know this is just like i said I it's the marketing that. tool yeah. and and it's the passion outlet mm-hmm. for everything else that we get to do so uh would you suggest that they would try to start with some sort of royalty figure out a like way that? to make a living okay. yeah okay before you build a car <laughs> to summarize it like that <laughs> Yeah. Um, is there any last things that you want to share that you want to talk about that we haven't talked about that I haven't brought up? You were so eloquent with how you brought up the classic auto <laughs> show. So I want to I want to make sure I'm not missing like this gaping hole in our conversation that someone's screaming at their phone or screaming at their computer. <laughs> going, Why didn't he ask that? Is there anything um, I'm missing? Well, I can't tell you much about computers because I really don't go on them. <clears throat> you know, I did I did once. You went on I a, computer a computer one time. And, and I thought, okay, I'm going to get into this world and, yep. and e- email and all that. Sure. And I remember sitting on the on the computer for about four hours one day, and I'm thinking, you know, what did I just get done? So <laughs> I gave my computer to somebody else and said, okay, I do not want to get involved with this. Yeah. So if anybody needs to email me, it goes through Lynn Stout. <laughs> okay. I do texting. I don't even do voicemail on my phone because Perfect. I would get 60 voicemails yeah. on my phone and I'd be spending an hour and a half Calling everyone listening back. to it and then writing down all the phone numbers. Okay, i got to call this person. So I left my voicemail off. So don't ever leave a voicemail for me. Just <laughs> and we won't me. be giving out. Do you want to give out your number? I don't think so. Um, yeah, I noticed that. Is, is that your design room right right there? Uh, actually, I do all my design work at home. Okay. And I have an office behind Lynn Stubbs. Oh, okay. Cool. Where, I, where I actually have a, a drawing table in awesome. there. Awesome. But yeah, that's, that's actually the break room. And the fastener room, so a it's it's a room that room. I always wanted. I've got all the list of cabinets. Saw that. Underneath that. Saw that. And you can pull open. You know, one yep. says stainless, one says metric, yep. one says you know nuts and bolts, and and everything is in there that we need to build the cars. It's all uh, wow. you know organized, and that's my dream room. It's a nice room. Yes. <laughs> well, Chip, with that <laughs> pleasure, Jimbo. I really, really Thank appreciate you so much. it. So I'm gonna. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Auto Detailing Podcast. Head on over to autodetailingpodcast.com for full show notes and links of everything that we've talked about today. And don't forget to check out our resources page for a direct link to all the products talked about not only on today's episode, but that I use in my day-to-day detail business. They have direct links so you can purchase and get free shipping right from that page. That's autodetailingpodcast.com. We'll see you on the next episode.